another, yes, another exciting episode of Epicenter. Actually, this is episode 34. Um, and I have an amazing guest here today, Mr. George Hartel. Do people call you Mr. or just Kun? Kun George, yeah. Kun, Most, yeah. Kun George. Or, or Kun Josh name? sometimes. Kun Josh. Yeah, sometimes. Is that your middle name? No, no, it just sounds like George. So it's, I go with that as well. Kun Jot. Kun Josh. Okay, good. So uh, we're here with uh, Kun Jot <laughs> or Kun George Hartel, Mr. George Hartel, um, COO of Supara. CCO. CCO. Yeah. Of Supara Group. Yep. Which, uh, well, he's going to tell the story, but I'm going to first ramp this up because George and I, um, we met in the most, um, how would I say, uh, obvious way. We were on an island. We were stranded. We had a few drinks. And um, we started chatting. I think it was at a barbecue. Mm. And lo and behold, it turns out that we lived in the same neighborhood. Yeah. Like actually two or really three. Really close. St- yeah, three streets apart. And... Um, you know, it was like uh, a match made in heaven. It was like romantic from the beginning. Well, for you Gen Zers, I mean, this is actually how people really meet, like actually bumping into each other and making friends and don't need to go onto some social platform and swipe left, swipe right, whatever. But as George and I began to know each other, um, I became really interested in his background. I mean, he's done some amazing stuff and um, basically how he transformed a company and a business um, during a pandemic and and to being an amazing success story. Um, So George, welcome to Epicenter. Ronan, thank you for having me today. I'm super excited to be with you and thank you for that uh, romantic introduction that you (laughs) shared with your audience. yeah, uh, you know, I've been fortunate to have met you, and um, really excited to be here today to share what we've been doing and the journey that we've been on. I think it's a very unique journey that that we've undertaken, and draws on a lot of experiences from multinational companies working with the big giants, and then now like working with a Thai family business to do transformation. They're, they're kind of two different walks of life. But a lot of the principles that matter to build businesses and grow them and to innovate and build great teams all apply, whether it's a big business or uh, you know a, a local business. And so it's been a lot of really a lot of fun to to do this uh, locally, and uh, it's been a great pleasure to get to know you and your family as well. That, that's awesome. And and today, um, because I, I think it, it, I just want to set the uh, tone. We're going to talk about a digital transformation, basically going from bricks to clicks. And I know it sounds pretty colloquial, but let's kind of give the audience uh, a bit of your background because y- y- you know you're not from here. You come from New Orleans. Yeah. And uh, how does a, a boy go from uh, New Orleans to Bangkok, and and what's the path that that took? So give us sure. a sense of <laughs> of of you and your ramp up uh, to here. Yeah, I mean, New Orleans is a special place, and anyone who's been there knows uh, how wonderful of a city it is in the U.S. I grew up there, um, and you know, I think if I look back at the journey that I've been on, there's always been this excitement around like building and growing. And so I, I, you know, I grew up there, I was an engineer, uh, went to Tulane, I was a biomedical engineer and a mechanical engineering minor. So wh- wh- how I now sell shirts and underwear is you still, are smart. It's still a long journey to go through, so I hope we have time. But yeah. um, I was fortunate enough after university to go work at Newell Brands. At the time it was Newell Rubbermaid. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, Newell is, for those of you that are listening that don't know, Newell Brands is one of the largest consumer durable goods companies in the world that I said no one's ever heard of usually. So 
Brands like rubber pens, Rubbermaid, Sharpie, Graco uh, baby products, Calphalon, Coleman Outdoor, Gita, Yankee Candle, um, just to name a few, right? But there's about a hundred household brands that are part of the portfolio. And I spent my time there with them, really working on a combination of taking like tired old portfolios that had latent, you know, latent brand equity and rebuilding them, rebuilding the portfolio, rebuilding the teams working on them. We were acquiring businesses that needed to scale. Some were offline and needed to get online. Some were in the US and needed to go global. Some were international brands but never launched in the US. So over the course of 15, 16 years, there was this nonstop capability and movement, even for me, like the family moved five times in 10 years. We went from Charlotte, North Carolina to Virginia uh, to uh, back to Atlanta and then Bangkok and almost ended up with one more move uh, when we ultimately decided to stay in Bangkok. And I think if I look at that journey, all of these experiences with so many brands and types of businesses. We did DIY, I was doing home improvement products with Lowe's and Home Depot, I was doing uh, paint brushes at one time. I did mops and cleaning products for hospitals. And then we did pens like Paper Made and Sharpie. And they were all in all different parts of the world and all different channels. So I was very fortunate to have touched and experienced so many different types of business. And I think when I looked at the business in Asia, I was heavily involved in the strategy that we worked on to enter China. And we had to do a refresh in India on Sharpie and PaperMate. And I kind of started to spend a lot more time in Asia. Mm -hmm. Nothing like the experience that you've been been doing wow. over the years. But Th this show is about you today. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> but <laughs> but it but it but it really started to get me excited because this was such a build region and you could do so much. So after two years of working on the entry strategy, the, the Newell team asked me to come out to uh, Asia to run the business here and keep building it. And we happened to have a pretty decent sized office in Bangkok. Mm -hmm. uh, we made all of the, the, uh, the, the white the correction fluid pens oh. for the world in like a bang, about 10, 10 miles from here. And we we landed and we as a family we were the first time expats and we just fell in love with Bangkok and I think part of it is my wife Michelle we met in New Orleans at Tulane and we we Tulane is a lot like Bangkok mm -hmm. it, it is multicultural it it's got nightlife it's has spicy food it's full of tourists a lot of the days and it just has a genuine group of people that are really special in its own way. People that know New Orleans will say, there's no place like New Orleans. There's no people that live there that are like people from New Orleans. And Bangkok, to a large degree, is like this as well. So we really fell in love with Bangkok on a personal level. Professionally, I was really enjoying being in Asia. And then we decided to make this huge leap and just said, we really would love to stay in Bangkok. And to do that, it was going to require me to uh, find a way to not get moved around all the time, which is what I'd been doing right. professionally and to the whole family. We were right? even supposed to move to India at some point. We, right? we had talked about India. We had visited Shanghai as a family mm -hmm. on a look -see. The company wanted me back in the U.S., um, which was a big opportunity and hard to even say no to because it was a great opportunity. And, and Newell was so good to us for so long. And we made the decision, said, look, we really want to be here. And so I said, well, if I'm going to be here and you really want to live in Bangkok and I, and, I, and I really like Thailand, then I need to do something that keeps us here, but that is also is exciting for me to do from a professional standpoint. How can I help? I said, well, the, the, the transformation parts still apply. Mm -hmm. and so I was fortunate enough to link up and started the transformation work on GQ. And 2019, we started this journey. And so, then, so for the audience, right? Yes. GQ is not a, a big U.S. corporate. No, GQ is not a U.S. corporate. It, it is, is a, a small, yeah. family-run yeah. business. Right? Yeah, yeah, we're privately held, um, a single, you know, one family ownership, uh, multi-generational. So now on the third generation, wonderful group to work with, and it's been really. Fortunate over the last five years that they've you know welcomed me into the the family unit and our whole family, 
And you know, it's been a really exciting journey watching uh, the the business and the team grow over the last. You know, now May will be five years, and mm-hmm. you know, tr- on a, on a per, you know on the output side, we're like we've outpaced everyone. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not, we're not shy about that. Right. We've really we've beaten everyone in our peer set for the last five years, even during COVID, and it it has been because of us systematically putting in place what we believe is a better operating model, whether you're small or big in inside the inside but, the organization. That, that just didn't happen, right? And it definitely doesn't just happen in a in a family run business, right? Here you are, you join in 2019, right? Months after you join, COVID hits, retail shops that you guys operate are closed. You have hundreds or thousands of mouths that you guys are feeding and nobody is at your stores and you don't have much of a digital presence. Right. Right. Yeah. So here you are thinking, what do we do, right? Yeah. How do we transform this? And and you're also stuck on a remote island, uh Koh Samui, yeah. with, with uh, yeah. an idiot like me. Uh, yeah. Um so tell tell us about that because how do you go from that to where you are right now? Yeah, I, I think if we go back just a little bit before COVID hit, right? Yeah. So we're kind of mid 2019, and we're just starting the transformation journey. And and you know, I've been very fortunate to have an uh, an amazing partner with Win, the, mm-hmm. the CEO, and he. He, from day one, he believed in the conversations we were having of what was possible. He believed in me as well, and he was bringing me in as the first foreigner, the first Farang mm-hmm. hire at 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 the company, right? And he made a big bet bringing me me in, and I I can't thank him enough for that. And I do on a regular basis. And he also is very genuine and thanks me for making the leap as well. And this bond that we've built early on. Fueled uh, in excitement all the way up until November of 2019 when we launched the GQ White shirt. Mm-hmm. And that GQ White was a fundamental shift in the apparel business. Mm-hmm. So for decades, for the family, for the industry, everybody is seasonal, mm-hmm. fast fashion. Here comes the collection. When it sells out, here comes the next one. And we said, no, we're going to take a different approach. And we borrowed some of the principles from the, the CPG, FMCG mm-hmm. business. We went out, we did insights. We said, well, what's wrong with the category? What are men struggling with? And we started to hear things like men don't understand their sizing. Like if you ask 10 men, what size shirt do you wear? And they say, uh, I'm ML, I don't know, it depends on the size. Now, you're an e-commerce guru, right? How do you get people to buy online when they don't even know their size, right. they don't even get into the returns discussion. Yeah. Like, just they won't even purchase. You can't get people to convert if they don't understand their sizing system. So we developed. We went out and we measured a thousand Thai men, mm-hmm. which had never really been done before. And we said, well, what is the actual size and pattern we need for ties? Because Asian cut is actually right. mostly Japanese yes. branded influence. And we found that there were significant differences in how uh, ties. Bodies are particularly the thickness of their neck, the shoulder width, how their waist to neck shoulder ratios. And we actually built an algorithm that you can just measure the shoulder. And so we created what was called GQ size. Mm-hmm. So there's no SML, XL standard sizing in GQ. People learned that they're GQ 44, or 45, or 50. And now they know that that's their size. Mm-hmm. So we tried to eliminate this problem of purchasing online and remembering what your size was. If you want to still go to the store and try on, sure. And then the second part was that we were like, we don't want to be an apparel, we don't want to be a fashion business. Mm-hmm. And we say this repeatedly, we want to be a tech apparel company. We want to talk about problem solving innovation. And so GQ White was the first step in that. We went out, we said, well, everyone has a white shirt. What's the problem with the white shirt? Um, Most people are probably yeah, wearing any white. Dirty. You're going to get it dirty. You're going to yeah. spill your coffee on it. So this is like fear number one. You're going to get like yellow under the armpits. Exactly. All of these things were real. So we basically created a white shirt that mm-hmm. was essentially stain proof. And we demoed it to, to men and consumers. And we learned that essentially guys buy reasons why. Guys want fast cars. They want, not to overly stereotype, but yes. they want yes, gadgets. Guys want gadgets. And... So they buy on that. So when we communicated, we started talking about gadgety things, like how hard it would t- you would have to pull to rip the button off, and uh-huh. how far, how much you could pour on the shirt to, you know, to show the pressure test of the product. And when we did that, we launched it with this 
really amazing viral video that we worked on. And it ended up with 50 million views in the first month. Wow. And we sold, we'd never sold more than like 200 shirts, white shirts in a day. And we sold 200,000 shirts in the first 60 days. And, and what it did was, this is pre-COVID, right? Is, Just is this COVID. the video of like people getting like orange juice and yeah, they everything were pour, I mean, on and, and it went crazy. People at oh. UGC wanted to pressure test. They were pouring water all over themselves, coffee in the soy. And it just created this amazing campaign where people were showing it off. People throwing buckets on each other to see if they could almost wow. pressure test the product. We got to put that in the show notes. And 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 so what, what more it did was not only, I mean, obviously we sold a lot of shirts and it was a huge success for sort of rebranding the business of where we were going. But it built the confidence inside mm-hmm. the organization that we were rallying around one single idea and one product. And mm-hmm. that you could sell a lot of it if you really built something great and did a really good job with viral marketing. And so we were heading into the Songkran season. If you recall, there was a, I don't even know if you remember, there was a color changing shirt that we were planning to launch for Songkran. When you squirt the water, the color would change. It's so dead now that it, it you don't even know about it, right? Wow. So we were just about to launch that. We spent a huge amount of money on this really innovative new, we were, mm-hmm. and the campaign was like, we're going to change Songkran forever. Mm-hmm. And the day we launched the PR at two o'clock, Con Can, and everyone started canceling Songkran because of COVID. And that was like mid-February. And by the next two weeks, all water festivals, everything was canceled. And they announced March 10th that all retail was closing. The lockdown was starting. And like you said, we were sitting there going, holy moly, what do we do, mm-hmm. right? We Our retail business, we were just getting e-commerce started. A few, this is 2019. Shopee was still kind of early days. Lazada was the big player in town. We were learning to get our D2C website mm-hmm. up and running. Retail shutting down was a big problem. Yes. And so then the pivot happened that you were referring to. We said, well, what do we do? What, do we, what can we do? We have hundreds and hundreds of people in the organization. We can't leave them out to dry. And and we looked around and said, okay, well, what are people using and wanting right now, mm-hmm. right? They needed a mask. Yeah. And we said, well, we can't do any mask because we're supposed to be problem solvers inside the organization. So what was wrong? And and it was great. Like we in 10 days, we designed, developed, and launched the loop system, mm-hmm. which became the gold standard in Thailand with the built-in lanyard. Yep. The inside of it, people were complaining about getting some form of acne already. In the early days, so we went and sourced medical grade fabric from the inside that people use in diabetes patients mm-hmm. for their legs to wrap them mm-hmm. to re- reduce the amount of bacteria on the face. So it worked. And the outside, we used the GQ white fabric. So you would sneeze in the demo, or uh-huh. you would throw water on your face, it would bounce off. So it was like connecting the shirt and the mask. That was the original intent. We had no idea it was going to go as big as it did. We launched it, it crashed the website five times that first day. Uh, we got it back up and running, and uh, six weeks later, like more than a million masks have been sold. Every retailer in Thailand was calling because they needed masks to sell. Retailers that had nothing to do with like pharmacies, they needed masks because mm-hmm. they needed to stay open and needed essential items. Mask was an essential item, so they yes. could sell mobile phones if they had masks, right? So yeah. we became hot overnight. And the whole company shifted to be mask making in the middle of COVID, both here and then abroad in the U.S., which is where the the, the next part of this learning came for us about selling outside of, of Thailand on Amazon and mm-hmm. D2C in the U.S. And so it was an incredible like 60 to 90 days where we didn't have capacity to make all these masks. We had to crowdsource factories all over Thailand. We kept... 2020, we kept 3,000 sewers maxed out OT all the way through most of the first phase of the lockdown, where most factories were stopped. We were just finding any you know anyone we could get that could sew the mask to keep up with the demand we had globally. And yeah, it was a crazy pivot, but it taught the team two things, right? One was go keep problem solving even in the face of adversity, and two, speed that we always mm-hmm. talked about. Every time someone now says, oh, that's going to take a long time to mm-hmm. develop, we sit in a meeting and remind them, you remember when we did the mask in 10 days? Don't don't say that it's going to take four months to develop this. We can do anything in 10 days. We can do 
any new project even faster. So it, it, it helped build the confidence of the team. And of course, it it catapulted us in a whole new direction as we made our way through the pandemic. That is such an amazing story. And in so many parts, because there's learnings to it, right? You talked about confidence a bunch of times already. Yeah. Right. And and you have to give people the emotional confidence, right, to be able to do the things that they and the safety to do the things that they want to do, but also the innovation, right? And and challenging yourselves beyond the limits that you know, right? And and once you have that new high water mark, in this case, ten days. If it's ten days, we can do something in ten days, like. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you instill that confidence in I, them. I, I think too, Ronan. One of the things just to add on briefly is separate from the the confidence was the team learned to get really scrappy. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were in the middle of a lockdown. We we were the studios. No one would let us shoot. Like mm-hmm. we we did the the Crayola shoot for the U.S. at my house mm-hmm. with my neighbor's kids and our photographer came and we had like a single green screen backdrop in our driveway mm-hmm. outside in April, right? It was like a hundred degrees, yeah. like they're forty, almost forty degrees Celsius, and we did it. And the team did it on a dime budget with everything closed. And so they learned that you don't need the big agency, you don't need the big budget to film and shoot that you can actually get really great quality work if, if you're thinking in a really kind of scrappy way. Mm-hmm. And I don't think any of them want to go back to that photo shoot in the middle of the driveway, but man, they still refer to it as being, remember those days, like that was a lot of fun. It was hard work. It was late nights trying to get it all together in time and people worked really hard, but they they still we're enjoying the work, and I think that's was doesn't really that, important. Doesn't that set the tone for for the way that you, as a leader, and how you are changing the mindset of your team, right, to start to shift, right? Because it's moving out from a traditional mindset that is we always do things this way. How can we change now? They've shifted their mindset to see that hey, we can do things scrappy. We can do hustle. We can do you know things that we didn't think were possible at speeds that were possible. So you're all you're starting to be a change maker. You're starting to already transform the organization, whether you you knew it at that moment or not. The, you, you you know within months of 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 COVID onset. Now you have a whole different type of company with a whole different type of mindset, right? Yeah, you know, I think this is ingrained inside. Um, we 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 have this. We have a series of um, you know our, our purpose statement is to create life changing wearable solutions. Mm-hmm. But some of the values we we believe in that we talk about that are on the walls. If you come to the office or. You know, or things like to think like an owner, and um, the one that that you're referring to also is to like make th- make it a wow. Mm-hmm. And that one, you know, like when you're in a room and someone presents something to you, or you see something in your feed, or you see something on TV, or whatever you're consuming, and you go, "Wow!" Mm-hmm. If you can't do that when you're looking at the idea or the the presentation or whatever it is, then it's not good enough. Mm-hmm. And sort of go back and do it again, and it's not like a, it's. It becomes like their guard, their their guardrails around, their gate around whether or not something's okay to do or not. And in many days, we talk about like you know what you just showed is like ordinary. Mm-hmm. It's expected. Mm-hmm. We want the unexpected. Mm-hmm. We want we want the twist on the campaign. We want the twist in the product uh, assortment and even the mask. There was a twist to it, like the way we did it. We could have just made a two loop mask, mm-hmm. like everyone else, and copied the hospital mask. But it, we, we they went one step further with it, and it's been like that all four years with each of the the, the successes that we've had. It, it it's been in, you know really about how do you make things a wow, mm-hmm. and you know that means sometimes the cost is a little higher to make the product right, or the video is. Got to go back and get redone, and the timelines get crunched. Like this is part of making sure you don't really sacrifice something that you know is the right thing to do to make it a wow, just because of some part of the the 
requirements that are in your business. And that, that's what we try to encourage, whether we're talking to big company or small company, people in your audience now. Mm-hmm. Like, try not to let cost, I know it's hard, yeah. try not to let cost, the legal team, you know, uh, some policy internally create this this squeezing feeling amongst the team where they can't really do the innovation and what we call the wow work. Mm -hmm. So if I understood correctly, pre-2020, companies mostly uh, a retailer, right? Probably yep. had this, some online yeah. sales. Did, well, none, none, none. So 2019, we were in the district. The distribution model was so just pure bricks. I mean, pure department store. Pure bricks. department. So store. we're in the department store only. No own store in the plazas in the mall. Just the department store counters. No e-commerce. Zero. And some some prior to that, there was a bunch of OEM business. Now, what was nice is that the R and D side of the business had. Done a lot of OEM over the over the decades mm-hmm. for North Face, Japan, uh, Under Armour, Nike. So part of the family's business was doing OEM for large brands, but that's a complicated business to be the factory for yeah. big brands. And you're sort of one new sourcing director away from moving your factory from Thailand to Bangladesh or you know another part of the world uh, in, in 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 Vietnam, and so. It, it, it that's not a business that we wanted to stay into, so we exited those. And Wynn did a lot of that mm-hmm. heavy lifting before I got there, which was great. So I, I didn't have to do too much of it with him, um, and and that helped as we could just focus on like the the consumer facing side of the business. And, and so you start to build this basically direct to consumer engine, right? You're building the team, you're in- increasing their capabilities. You're improving the way that they think, their mindset, um, and you're proving it with a lot of the changes that you've done. From you know the white T-shirt being one of the first iterations, but then the mask, then the underwear, then then then. Yeah. And here you are taking a, a a business that again was reliant on its on its pre, uh, on its physical presence to now being. Almost, I mean, it has a dual strategy, right? There's the 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 retail strategy, which has also been completely overhauled and super successful, beautiful stores now. But the 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 digital side of your business is is also equally interesting, right? And and probably a, a major part of um, the growth engine for GQ going forward. And I think there there's. Um, The speed at which you guys are, the the pace of innovation is very interesting. Mm. And I remember um, you telling me about a new channel that you guys were basically um, exploring with TikTok shops, mm. right? And you almost got. You guys thought you were fast, but. Now you 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 learn of there there's fast and there's China fast yeah. or China speed. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about like what is the learning that you had of, of, with your experience with TikTok and how that also helped shape the way that the company thinks in 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 pace and innovation and 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 basically the speed in which you can move. Yeah, I think I think there's like two really great examples of the the what you call the China speed. Um if I go back just before we talked TikTok, the first example of it was when we launched D2C to the US mm-hmm. from during during COVID. So we pushed really hard uh with the partnership with Crayola, who licensed the brand and we were selling pre-order 30 day pre order because we were still making the product to ship to the US. We got so popular, like the number one rating on Amazon. And all of a sudden, we started getting reviews on our product. And we were like, how, how can we have re reviews? We haven't even shipped the product to the US. And the Chinese teams had already copied <clears throat> the mask and had shipped it to the US. And consumers were, they had hijacked their listing, right? Because we were still learning. We didn't know how to, to, to do the. The gatekeeping on our brand registry right. yet. We were still learning Amazon. And so we they hijacked the listing, they started shipping product, and the product wasn't to spec. So people were complaining. We were getting all these one and two star reviews on our product that we hadn't even made one yet. Of course, Crayola was upset. Like, why are these reviews coming in? 
so but what it what it showed us was like wow like while we thought we were fast mm-hmm. ten, you know the, the Crayola thing you know program took about 45 days even with the licensing deal and we shipped in 30 days from the first P order we got from consumers mm-hmm. and we thought man we are really moving it mm-hmm. they copied us made manufactured the product shipped it to the US and consumers had it before we could even get our orders out the door wow and we were in the images they had shot they did photos too so we were talking about this china speed and said wow <laughs> we should you know maybe we need to learn from the uh-huh. china team like how can they be so fast and then when we to, to fast forward to your original question when we started meeting the by dance team from China, um, as we started to scale TikTok earlier this year, you know, I, I've told the story a few times, but it's just been completely like and you know mesmerized with the fact that their team came from China. Mm-hmm. They did not want to. They didn't have one PowerPoint slide. Mm-hmm. They showed up. At, they they pre they pre-requested, can we do home visits? Mm-hmm. Can we go see the market? Can we talk to your team? Can they tell us about what their experiences is in the seller center? What are the issues? They walked in with notepads and phones to video us, and we went to home visits to see consumers and how they consume TikTok, and they sit on the floor and where they sit on their mm-hmm. bed. and. All of this we documented, and we learned how they thought as well, and how they viewed the consumer's journey. And what was amazing is the feedback we gave them during these sessions about the seller experience as a, as a brand. Mm-hmm. The next week, the things were fixed. Now, I, I look. I, I don't want to contrast it with my good friends across the pond in California, multiple brand agencies yes. that do ads, but. I can't imagine me making a request to change the platform in country to any of those large scale advertisers and and see them like listen and change it within the next week. And our teams felt so empowered that they told the management at TikTok and ByteDance that this was an issue and the next week these issues were resolved. And it was fascinating to see this. And so we built this relationship with ByteDance, and as a result, we've scaled this business. It's scaled so fast, Ronan. I mean, the live streaming and the affiliates and the, the the actual entertainment value on TikTok, everyone knows, but the TikTok shop has scaled so fast so in fast. Thailand now that we're still number one on Shopee, number one on Lazada in men's, and now TikTok is now bigger than Lazada. Wow! In nine months, that's crazy. And, and growing month on month on month, and and we can't we can't like pump it fast enough. And the assortment is very different. Mm-hmm. The user purchases very different product than our retail stores, and even very different than Shopee and Lazada. So it's been a totally new consumer we've picked up, and um, their their taste and their uh, the assortment that we have to make for them now is very different. So we're starting to think about okay, what are the product ranges that satisfy the customers in the TikTok platform? But just the 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 speed, you know, uh, is incredible. I think I think truthfully, China gets a lot of flack, particularly from Americans sometimes about the way they operate, and and you don't have to agree with anything. Mm-hmm. Politically or whatever, but you have to admire their e-commerce capability. Absolutely, it is, it is it is by far the most advanced and fastest at 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 doing things that I've seen yet in the world. Absolutely. So I'm I'm <laughs> I'm super impressed because it, it seems that in 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 four or five years of of uh, basically transforming this business. From from a uh, traditional retailer now to a full blown, you could call yourselves an e commerce company, right? I mean, you, you're driving business direct to consumer. You have your retail strategy. Um, you, there's a lot of brands out there that are, are going to hear this story and and be be amazed with this type of transformation because it's not uh, it's not trivial what you've done and it's not simple. Hmm. Right. This is this is brands are struggling to transform even till today. Right. I mean, COVID was a a, a, a great digital accelerator, and um, you guys are you know you're you're one of the poster childs of of basically how do you transform a business. Right. Um, what are the learnings? 
what are the learnings? What what did you guys learn that is um, repeatable in, in terms of principles, in terms of how you know you talked about it, but I, I think there's a lot of learnings that I, you, you can unpack from this. Mm-hmm. How does a brand go from being a traditional brand and mind you, you are at a traditional brand at a family run business to becoming a brand that is now well known globally, uh, of course, major presence in Thailand and has a major success in, in the digital world. What did you learn? It's uh, it's been such a learning journey. You know, sometimes it's easy to come on and talk about what we what we've done and and describe it, but for all of us, it's mm-hmm. been such a learning. I mean, it, it, if you if when we're hiring, when we're when we're r- sort of I call it raising people in the organization, so many of the people, if you talk to them now, they have grown incredibly in the last four or five years. I mean, people, the, the the people who run parts of our business, they didn't start that way. We all like learned it together. We didn't know how to do Amazon. We clicked like everyone else and signed up as a seller. And then we learned it and we did it. And we, we, we started to do the D2C business and we went out and we watched what was working in the market. And we talked to people in other parts of the world that are really Great friend of Wins in 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 Hong Kong, uh, Roman. He really taught us like how to do D 2 C really well, like really get conversion. And one of the principles I think has gotten lost in all of this is we were very set on it. We were like we're going to be unit economic positive from day one. And I think we it's easier now after all that has happened with startups and the challenges that the the uh, tech communities had over the last 18 months but we we were thinking about that before and it wasn't while we watched a lot of other people around us trying to scale and dumping tens and tens of millions hundreds of millions mm-hmm. of dollars into growth for growth's sake right we were busy focusing on how do we make our business sustainable and unit economic positive. And now we've built a very, very strong, very strong business, both mm-hmm. D to C and in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. And those businesses mm-hmm. are 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 profitable. I would say if you if you asked around in Thailand, you would find very few e-commerce businesses that are profitable. Mm-hmm. And ours is. And so we're quite like when we talk about that, it's at scale. We mm-hmm. spend at scale as much as anyone on D to C advertising. And we do it with incredibly high ROAS and mm-hmm. we do it with very, very strong profitability on on the business. And it's been attributed to like this obsession that the team has had mm-hmm. with learning the whole time. Like we learned TikTok mm-hmm. when we started to scale as Shopee scaled, we learned how to be involved in their flash deals and how to do super brand days mm-hmm. and how to work with their account managers and how do we manage the logistics of all these deliveries on 1111 and 1010 I mean how do you ship 10,000 orders in one day mm-hmm. you know it's like I gotta you have to really be thinking about a lot more than just the selling side like how do we execute that and so all of this is back to this the team, Really tries, and we try to hire for it. We try to hire for people that are like naturally curious. So some of our e-commerce people that are the best in their space, like they don't have uh, traditional sort of business backgrounds mm-hmm. per se. Like one's an accountant, one's a lawyer. You know, uh, I have an engineer. These are the people running our you know e-commerce business. They don't. They one came from an agency. They, they they didn't in some cases they had no experience in ecom but they came in they learned what we were trying to do and they just have a natural curiosity for growth and 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 problem solving and with that we can work with with the teams quite quite well to scale but that's been the biggest learning for us is making sure i think it's for anyone listening like mm-hmm. i don't know when i'm not sure when business when it became okay mm-hmm. <laughs> to just not make money for the business. That's yeah. fine in some specific situations, but this idea of like building an e-commerce business that's not 
profitable in any way, shape, or form is 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 I just don't I just don't subscribe to it. And we don't, and we won't, I think we will never subscribe to it that way. So so part of the ethos was like we have to be dollar positive, right? Yeah. Um we have to have the right people in place. Um you know, what else did you learn along the way? I, I think we learned also that you're going to make a lot of mistakes, mm-hmm. and the that's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that I, I, I talk a lot about, and it's not talked about enough in Thailand and Asia, is the importance of creating psychological safety with your teams. Mm-hmm. And it's missed so often in Thailand. Like even for foreigners coming in, you know, there's this idea that I'm the big boss and that I'm supposed to mm-hmm. sort of tell you what to do. And when you do something bad, I'm going to shame you or give you warnings. And it's that th- th- there is nothing that we've done, and we failed a lot along the way. We can go through those, and we probably need a whole other show to talk about our failures. Mm-hmm. But what what we try to do with the teams is not look at them that way. It, it, we we look them. We really do look at them as learning opportunities, mm-hmm. and they're, the teams know that, so they're willing to take more risks. Like, hey, let's try this, and we try things, and they just don't work. And we're like, what? Why did we? Why did it not work? We tried a new category, didn't work. Like the brand couldn't quite stretch there. We mm-hmm. tried during COVID. We were trying to do like GQ Life, which mm-hmm. like. Fatalai John and vitamins and like all these things that were medical related because of the mask. And then we really were like, <clears throat> wait, this isn't really working for us. So we stay, staying you know, in your in your I, core, right? We, we, yeah, but it was also like, okay, where does the brand stretch and mm-hmm. where can it not? Like there's areas where it can stretch, right. but there's areas where you're like, look, the brand's not gonna go there yet. Maybe in the maybe in the future it could. So we 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 really focus on this and and it, experimenting and trying things and just looking at them as real, true learning opportunities builds this team, the psychologically safe team. Mm-hmm. And in meetings, you see it like assistant product manager, marketing person will speak up to me. He will tell the CEO me like, "Hey, I don't agree with you." Mm-hmm. And that, um, for a new person coming in, that's in a, from a traditional environment, they're like, "Wow." Did you just like contradict you in the meeting? And my job is to not react, right? Mm-hmm. This is the problem with leaders. You're sort of sitting in a room with your team, and someone says to you, Ronan, I don't agree with your strategy. Mm-hmm. You immediately, like, your brain lights up and you're ready to go. You want to pounce. And that's your natural reaction. And the key is to just, say, okay, tell me more about why you don't mm-hmm. agree. Because there's probably something in there you can learn. Yes. And the team sense that, and it's not about like the power or the you know. But they start to build this zone of safety with the group, and then it really can flourish. We recently had a um, it was really kind of an op- eye opening moment. We had someone who's very senior at another uh, large uh, brand that's super successful in Thailand. I'll just keep it sort of anonymous for the mm-hmm. purpose of the story. They came and they sat in our all hands meeting. And they were they at the one point they were interested maybe they would come join but they were like let me fill out what's going on. and we said you know we're not going to go through a traditional interview process with you like we met we chit chat we talked like, why don't you come see what we're all about mm-hmm. so they sat through our all hands that we do once a month it's top thirty in the company sit in the room the U for U shape and everyone gets up and talks and at the break we walked over we said hey what do you think like what do you what did you they looked right at went in me and said. I, I don't know how I can't help you all. I don't even know what I what value I would add. You have a team of vibrant people shouting across the room their ideas and laughing out loud and like challenging you and your presentation and challenging the the the, the, the people presenting. It's wonderful, and they're like, I I, I can't I, I couldn't come here and like help. Like you can come help us, kind of like and. Mm-hmm. And until that moment, we were we were really hard on ourselves. Sometimes it was like an eye opening day for Wen and me, and and he shared this story as well. It was like wh- with the whole team, we shared it in another meeting. We said, "Look, this was a really great day mm-hmm. for, for us to see someone even kind of come from the outside and mm-hmm. share their experience of being inside our mm-hmm. walls." And 
It, it, it is. It's really been about this, you know, you asked what the biggest learning and what, what we picked this up and we're just trying to make sure we, as we grow, we don't lose this. It's very important for us that we don't, we don't get to become corporate-y and we don't get to be big and put a lot of policy and rules in place mm-hmm. that control things because then we'll lose the spirit of what has made it successful. It's beautiful. What do you want your legacy to be? Oh, I told you I had a curveball for you. Oh man, I I think that if I go back to this idea that you that I that I've always loved building, mm-hmm. and uh, I I think I I was presenting I think you were in one of the presentations at Sassen recently, and then in my introduction slide it says if. If something's the more screwed up something is, the more messed up it is, the more I get excited. Uh-huh. But it's like a core product and business, and there's like, can you just manage the core? I, I really don't get that excited about it. No, you can do it, but maybe, but things that are really need to be like turned around, transformed, it's a build. Maybe it's a new country to enter. That that's exciting work, and uh, this idea of building is something that's really important to me. And I think if I, you know, I don't know, if I fast forward, maybe we'll all be in Thailand, I hope, for yeah, a long okay. time. If it's 20 years from now or 30 years from now, I, I, I hope that people look back and say that, you know, I was able to help them in some way, like transform or build something that's meaningful. We We talk about like this I don't want things that last a season. I we we want things that can last a generation. Mm-hmm. And I hope that some of the products that previously at Newell, we see them at hotels sometimes. I see them in hospitals. I see them in a mm-hmm. stationary aisle. It's really cool to see that. You're like sometimes I walk with the kids and I'm like, Dad, Dad was Dad built that. That was oh. a product. That, that gel pen we made. It took us 18 months to make a gel pen, but we won't get into that discussion. <laughs> uh, but you know, I see things now, and I, I I like that feeling. And I hope that you know, in some time in the future, people can look back and say we we did something that helped people. And then you know, of course, there's the the people side of it, and I, I tell my teams that I hope one day that you will get promoted or you will leave us. You will leave us to go mm-hmm. work somewhere and run your own business or run a company. That will be like really gratifying for me. And a lot of times they look at me and go, "What did he just say?" I said, "No, I want you to grow here and hopefully one day leave and run a company or run your own business." And that's what we want to build inside. So I, I hope maybe one of them maybe will hire me when I'm. When you're old, old and gray, yeah, you'll be <laughs> and, sitting on the it, uh, sitting on the the, the porch in uh, some way uh, overlooking the sunset. Maybe, maybe uh, <laughs> like I'll be asking watching the skin get leathery or uh, something. Uh, can I come yeah. up, George? Yeah, yeah, you're welcome anytime. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Um, I think you just like it sounds like you you've just done so much and accomplished so much in in a very short time in in. Uh, in, and it is a short time, right? The four, four, five years in GQ, right? And and probably still a lot more amazing stuff to do. Um, trailblazing, right? Doing stuff that uh, people didn't think was possible. And I'm watching uh, watching your progress and rooting for you guys from the side and hopefully I'm going to meet uh, Kun Win because he sounds awesome as well. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. I love him. Um, and uh, before we uh, wrap this, uh, I want to do some quick fire with you. Okay. Are you down? I, I'm so excited. Can you Are tell? you? No. <laughs> Let's see. Let's, Let's see. see. All right. Popcorn. Savory or sweet? Oh, <laughs> movie theater butter is that is that one of the options? That's I, I don't know. Savory, I mean, savory, not sweet, not sweet. Not but sweet. I, I will I will eat a whole bag of movie theater 
butter and my daughter as well. Do you like the truffle it, one? No, just the movie theater. Like the more butter, more butter, the better. Yeah, like it's all over your fingers. Like that's perfect. You got to yeah. bring wet wipes in there. Everything. Yeah, that's exactly right. What's your favorite book of all time? Oh. So you gave me one recently. I'll, can I have two? Is yes, that you can have two. Uh, yeah. Have so two. The, the one recently, which I was fortunate enough to meet Martin Lindstrom through you, and he's been on your uh, podcast as well. Um, you know, the, the the Ministry of Common Sense is like, in a way, it's like opened my eyes to being really clear about what you know you call small data or just looking around and mm-hmm. and I think that we in a way we were we were doing that before but like Martin's book gave it clarity and like words that really help and I I can't thank him enough for for the time we got to meet and what he shared about how we look at ourselves as sometimes being um lazy executives that we have to get everything in bullet point form and for, you know uh uh, one page or summaries in reality, like those have gone through so many filters that we've gotten ourselves what he sort of talked about so lazy yeah. that we can't even like go see for ourselves what's happening in our yeah. own stores or in our own app, right? Or yeah. whatever you're working on. So that was one and the one that I that I still love and we are we I talk a lot about even recently as we've built the the uh, fighting giants community is this idea of um the adjacent possible, which comes from Stephen Johnson's Where Good Ideas Come From. Mm -hmm. And the idea of this is that, hey, none of us are really that good at invention, and we're obsessive about invention. But as you know, like iPhone, many of the most incredible innovations in the world were never really inventions. They Mm -hmm. just pieced together things that were already readily available. Mm -hmm. And even things like the GQ White shirt, Everything we put into GQ White was already readily available. Mm-hmm. The repellent technology was available, the stain proof, the sweat proof, everything we did, cotton, every, everything we did was mm-hmm. already available. Even the box we put it in, it looked like a like an iPad when you got it. Mm-hmm. It all looked like that. So Stephen Johnson's Where Good Ideas Come From has been a guiding principle book for me mm-hmm. as you think about like the adjacent possible and being a synthesizer in in business and innovation. I'm going to have to read that one now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, If you could have unlimited supply of one thing, what would it be? Oh. So (laughs) you can't say popcorn. Not popcorn. Um, I I don't think it'll happen in our generation, but I I have recently, and uh, Michelle as well, we've gotten very focused on health. Mm -hmm. And I'm a couple of our friends, as you know, we're in this uh, chat group, and we're I'm very interested in seeing how long we're capable of prolonging life, and um, you know that that part is very interesting to me right now. Like, how do we crack the code on 120 years? And I don't know what that will look like. It will be probably a lot, lot more gray. You'd you'd have probably about as much hair as I do. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, I think this topic is you know like Sinclair's piece and the things that we've been discussing and trying is really fascinating and like things like managing glucose. All this is really fascinating. I think, and I think maybe we're just one one generation. I don't know if our kids will Mm -hmm. get to enjoy it, but one or two generations away from probably prolonging the lifespan of, of, of what you what consider a normal lifespan to be. I, I got a book to recommend. Do you? Outlive. Really? Yeah. So now we both have books to read. Yeah, well... Thanks for the homework. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dr. Peter Atia. Okay. It's I'll put awesome. It, put it down. Yeah, yeah. That's all about the living the maximum um, during your good years, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Who's the most inspiring person to you? Hmm. This is. I didn't make it easy. That's a tough one. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think she would be. She would be really annoyed almost that I'm going to say her, but hmm. you know Michelle quite well. Yes. Um, she. We've this year will be twenty years we were married, right? We got married very young. Um, 
and we we in, in next year actually, but we're in the twentieth year, and she's just been such a a. a a driving force for me to to constantly like better myself, and she's so creative and so thoughtful, and her everything that she does, and her friends that are in her network know this, and I I get to experience it every day, and so she she doesn't know it often enough, and maybe I probably don't say it, you know. You can look right over Thank there, you. George, Thank and you. say it, yeah. to Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, you do inspire me. Every day, and you have for the last twenty years. So thank you. Um, yeah, she's just wonderful with the kids and the family, and is the glue that kind of holds us. You're even gonna make all, me tear up here all, in a all second. together. There's and, a tissue uh, box on yeah, the table. So yeah, thanks. Thank you. What is one piece of advice you'd give your twenty-three-year-old self? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, so. For all the things that I did learn early on, I I did jump right into a big corporate mm -hmm. company. And um, while there were wonderful pieces at at Newell Newell Rubbermaid or Newell Brands at the mm -hmm. time in twenty three, I think that they there could have been some early days where the sort of Entrepreneurial, sort of, even some of the scrappy behaviors that we've picked up now at GQ, it would have been really awesome to have had those. And I, and I almost like love when we meet someone and we talk to them and they say, "Yeah, I tried a company and I failed." And mm -hmm. I'm like, "Okay, you're you're already through my first hurdle. Like you've been through the ups and downs." I would have loved early days to have had that, like full failure experience rather than the sort of running the corporate ladder just because I think it would have built a part of me that that I ended up maybe getting much much later in my in my career and this is something that you know you've kind of bridging your other question like it's something over the next sort of two decades I'm quite passionate about uh, you were at the session last week yes. that we did for in the 100 Plus CEOs and executives, and we're trying to build this community here in Bangkok, talking about this this need to. It's not a, fighting giants isn't about like a, you know going against corporates. It's people who are inside the giants are hurting too because yes. they're stuck like almost as a prisoner inside the system. And they want to break out of it, but they can't for whatever reason, the risk or challenges with it. And so what we're trying to do is just give some tools, even inside the big company, that can give people some of the sort of basic things that they can do to innovate and keep themselves mm -hmm. fresh. And I, I wish that I had, I could go back and tell 23-year-old me that those would be some fun things to to do, I'm not sure he would have listened, to be honest. Uh, but I think it would have been great to have that experience. M Michelle would have told him to listen. Yeah, 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 for sure. Dude, this has been awesome. Yeah, George, thank you so much for uh, dropping your knowledge on Epicenter, and uh, I think this is uh, I've learned so much uh, from you today, and and you should be proud of what you're building. And uh, you know, at at 43, you can. Uh, you're building some awesome stuff and you're having your startup experience uh, that you wanted to have at 23. So you go, boy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Yeah, Thanks. Great. All right. That's a wrap. <laughs>